Wagons roll across the United States in 1976 as part of the nation's bicentennial celebrations. For President Ford, this was a welcome break from fighting off the electoral challenge of a little-known governor from the state of Georgia. In the end, it was Jimmy Carter who swept to the White House. In Britain, the Queen said goodbye as Prime Minister Harold Wilson resigned. And the Conservative leader Margaret Thatcher began to establish herself as the Iron Lady who would revolutionise British politics. In China, the great revolutionary Mao Zedong died. By 1976, there had been no executions for 10 years in the United States since the Supreme Court had ruled that the Constitution forbade punishments that were cruel and unnatural. This equipment appeared to be as out of date as the torture chambers of the Inquisition. But the escalation of violence fueled a demand for the return of the death penalty. In 1976, the Supreme Court again permitted individual states to execute murderers. The issue was unexpectedly dramatized when a murderer welcomed and insisted on his own execution. I took them literal and serious and they sentenced me to death, just as if they just sentenced me to a 10 years or 30 days in the county jail or something. I thought you were supposed to take them serious. I didn't know it was a joke. His name was Gary Gilmore, and he came from Portland, Oregon, the son of an habitual thief. He started stealing at the age of 10, and by 14, he was in the McLaren School for Boys, a reformatory, where the main lesson he learnt was how to be a criminal. In and out of jail, at age 22, he was sentenced to 15 years for armed robbery. By the time he was 36, he had spent exactly half of his life behind bars. But he was far from being the usual hoodlum. He had a high IQ and assiduously educated himself. He was a graphic artist of real talent, but he also had a strong streak of self-destruction. In Oregon State Prison, he made 16 attempts at suicide, once swallowing a razor blade, and he entered into two frustrated suicide pacts with other inmates. Released on parole on the 9th of April, 1976, he went to live with an uncle and aunt in the town of Provo, in the state of Utah. There he got a job in a factory and met a girl named Nicole Baker, who at the age of 19 had already been married three times and had two children. They moved in together and he made some accomplished drawings of her emphasizing the little girl quality that appealed to him. In the six weeks they lived together, they fought. He went back to stealing, she began seeing other men, and he threatened to kill her more than once. On the 13th of July, he threw her out of the house and she went into hiding. Gilmore became obsessed with finding her and his threats became more extreme. On the 19th, he called on her mother, took back a stolen gun he had given her, and walked into this gas station with the gun. Working there was Max Jensen, a law student with a wife and child. Gilmore took $125 and told him to lie on the floor face down. Then he put the gun to the back of Jensen's head. He shot twice, saying, this one's for me, and this one's for Nicole. The following day, he killed again. This time, it was the manager of the city center motel, Benny Bushnell. Again, he callously shot his victim in the back of his head after he had collected whatever cash was available. Throwing away the gun after the second shooting, he accidentally shot himself in the hand. 
a garage mechanic noticed the blood and called the police. Gilmore was arrested after a brief chase. When she heard, Nicole said, he killed them instead of killing me. Gilmore first denied, then admitted the killings. All he was concerned about now was seeing Nicole as often as possible. At the trial in Provo in October 1976, the defense called no witnesses, and he was found guilty of murder in the first degree. In Utah, they have a second hearing to decide the punishment, and his lawyers did what they could to avoid the death sentence. As Ronald Stanger, one of the lawyers who later worked for Gilmore, pointed out, He has a lot of talent, and yet he was a product of this institutional uh, system that we have. Since the age of 14 years of age, he was under the, the care and control, if you, if you will, of the rehabilitation uh, uh, system. It didn't work. Why didn't it work with Gilmore? That's the question. But District Attorney Noel Wooten insisted on a sentence of death. It just wasn't realistic to think that he'd ever be rehabilitated. Uh, one of the things I thought at the time, but I didn't argue it, was that if you give him life in prison, the only thing we could do is probably is just lock him up in a cage like you would a gorilla at the zoo. But even with gorillas, somebody's got to go in and clean out the cage once in a while. And uh, the only logical conclusion is that the man just has to be destroyed. Even the defense psychiatrist conceded that he was legally sane, and the jury decided that he should be executed. The judge gave him the choice of hanging or shooting, and he opted for the firing squad. His lawyers successfully won a stay of execution, but when he heard this, instead of being grateful, he fired them. He explained his wishes in a letter in which he declared his lawyer's actions null and void. He insisted that he was sane, intelligent, and rational, and appealed to the state Supreme Court. There, his court-appointed lawyers tried to explain his decision. He doesn't wish to spend the rest of his life in prison. I can tell you what he stated in court, and I, I feel those to be his reasons, that he does not want, wish to, uh, as he put a languish in jail for the rest of his life. He doesn't want a life sentence. Because of the wide implications, pressure groups such as the American Civil Liberties Union stepped in. If Mr. Gilmore is executed, it will sanction that kind of act. Now on death row in Utah State Penitentiary, Gilmore took on a new attorney, Dennis Boas, who agreed to help him achieve his desire. Oh, yes, I, I believe he'll be executed. That's his wish. I'm convinced that he won't spend a life in prison. He argued Gilmore's request before the state Supreme Court. On the 10th of November, its spokesman announced... Stay of execution that was previously granted has been denied. The appeal that came in from the uh, attorneys in Provo has been vacated and that uh, it appears that the uh, date set for the execution will remain as uh, ordered by the district judge. But the very next day, the governor of Utah issued another stay of execution so that the state's board of pardons could review the case. The arrival of this ambulance at the prison on the 15th of November the day originally fixed for the execution broke the news that Gary Gilmore had attempted to preempt the discussion by taking his own life. He was rushed to hospital to have his stomach pumped. Gary had got Nicole to smuggle a bag of second old sleeping pills into the prison and to pass them over to him during their last farewell. She, too, had taken an overdose. A vial each of Secanol and Dalmain, 
and neighbors found her comatose after being let into her apartment by her three-year-old son. Clutched to her breast was her favorite photograph of Gary. Both of them were saved, and there was suspicion that on Gilmore's side, it was more of a dramatic gesture than a serious attempt. As a flotilla of police cars carried Gilmore back to jail, he bitterly commented to the sheriff he was shackled to, why don't they just get it over with? On their part, prison officials vowed that they wouldn't let it happen again. If anyone was going to kill Gary Gilmore, it was going to be them. A hero to his fellow prisoners, he asked to be allowed to speak to the convalescent Nicole on the telephone. When his request was refused, he went on a hunger strike that lasted 25 days. Lawyer Dennis Boaz was so affected by the suicide attempt that he withdrew from the case. And Gilmore's uncle, Vern D'Amico, now helped Gilmore to take on two new lawyers and an agent, Lauren Schiller, to exploit his story, which was now big news. On the 30th of November, the Board of Pardons met. For the first time anyone could remember, a condemned man pleaded not to live, but to die. I mean, you're a board that dispenses privilege, and uh, I've always thought that privileges were sought, desired, earned, and deserved. And uh, I seek nothing from you. I don't desire anything from you. I haven't earned anything, and I don't deserve anything either. The Board of Pardons also heard pleas to keep him alive, from parties ranging from a right to life group to the Socialist Workers' Party, Citizens Against Pornography, and the American Civil Liberties Union. About all of them, Gilmore said, They always want to get in on the act, the ACLU. I don't think they've ever really done anything effective in their lives. I would like them all, including that group of reverends and rabbis from Salt Lake City, to just butt out. I don't think they, uh, this is my life and it's my death. It's been sanctioned by the courts that I die, and I accept that. The board agreed. By a majority of two to one, they voted to go ahead. The death sentence imposed on Gary Gilmore will not be commuted or lessened, and the matter is ordered to re be returned to the court of the 4th Judicial District of the State of Utah for appropriate action. But the Civil Liberties Union petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court, arguing that the suicide attempt showed Gilmore to be mentally ill and thus unfit to plead. The Supreme Court delayed the execution again, ruling that the state of Utah give its reasons for execution. The ambulance was called again on the 15th of December after another suicide attempt, this time with phenobarbital. Ostensibly, the trigger was that Gilmore had failed to speak to Nicole from a courtroom telephone. Again, he survived. And the blood screening indicates he took what can normally be considered a lethal dose of a barbiturate such as phenobarbital. His level of the drug is at the midpoint of what can be considered the lethal range. However, physicians report that individuals oftentimes react differently to the same levels. And Mr. Gilmore appears to be handling the higher level reasonably well. Warden Smith was asked how a prisoner who was so tightly guarded could get so many pills. Well, he wasn't so closely guarded. Uh, as I indicated to press before, we could not sustain the kind of supervision that we had for a while. Released from hospital and transported back to jail, Gilmore was told the news that the United States Supreme Court had ruled by just five votes to four against the Civil Liberties Union. His execution was now finally set for the 17th of January, 1977. This time, there could be no more delays. The U.S. Supreme Court is the final arbiter in all matters of law. So Gary Mark Gilmore looked set to become the first person to be executed in the USA for almost a decade. At that moment, there were 423 men on death rows throughout the country, and at least some of them, including Gilmore, seem to have committed brutal capital crimes as a form of suicide, 
relishing the 15 minutes of fame execution brought with it. Back at the prison, the need to see Nicole became his obsession. Although his visitors smuggled letters in and out, he discovered an overwhelming need to see and talk to someone he loved and who loved him in his last days. He vowed that as long as the prison authorities refused to let her come and see him, he would make himself as big a nuisance as he could. Uh, Warden Hatch, just what uh, are you going to do now in the way of security? Well, Gilmore will be housed in the prison infirmary and we'll have an officer with him 24 hours a day. He'll be constantly supervised. He will not be allowed to have any contact visits whatsoever, and he'll be in semi-isolation. Security throughout the prison was tightened as the day of execution drew near. Prisoners had to shuffle round wearing shackles on their legs and handcuffs on their wrists whenever they left the buildings. Meanwhile, the Board of Corrections met to appoint the firing squad and to make the arrangements for the death Gary Gilmore wanted. The policy of the board in this instance will be that the execution is carried out with all the dignity and respect for the family of the inmate and the inmate as is possible under the circumstances and under the law. Fifth. For security reasons, there will be no advance notice of location of the execution, no identification of the firing squad, nor the number of witnesses limited. Gary Gilmore never did see Nicole Baker again. When he was asked which five people he would like to invite to witness his execution, he put her name at the top of the list. But she was still in Utah State Hospital and the staff and other patients were under instructions not to even mention his name. <laughs> Meanwhile, preparation for the execution went ahead. Warden Smith kept the press informed. There have been no major problems. There has been some te tension in the maximum security unit uh, where, these, uh, where Gilmore's housed. Things aren't as quiet, the relationships are more strained and so forth. We have agreed upon two possible sites, crime site, an alternative site. Other than that, we wouldn't give those sites. Uh, those will not re be revealed. Uh, we'd like it to go as smoothly if it, if it goes through as possible with the least amount of complications, and that would be the reason why we wouldn't name them specifically. As dusk fell on the evening of Sunday, the 16th of January, 1977, Utah State Prison was ringed with TV crews monitoring the comings and goings as desperate efforts were being made to postpone the judicial killing. Within the prison, a disused cannery had been selected as the place of execution. As the evening drew on, prison officials gathered. The official warrant of execution was delivered to Warden Smith. At 10 p.m., the Civil Liberties Union obtained a hearing with a judge and demanded a stay of execution on the new grounds that it would be a misuse of taxpayers' money. At 1 a.m., the judge granted their request. It looked as if the execution was off, at least for 10 more days. Gilmore was furious when he heard and offered to pay for his execution himself out of the large sums he expected his estate to make out of deals set for a book and a movie. 
The lawyers for the protesting groups greeted the decision as a great success. I think uh, the judge uh, spent some time. He obviously studied the law while he was out. Uh, I think the decision was a well-reasoned decision, and I think a proper decision. While state officials prepared their countermove, and the prison was chaotic with activity, Gary Gilmore was permitted to entertain his invited guests to an impromptu party. Relatives, lawyers and business representatives ate food provided by the prison caterers and sipped the liquor they had surreptitiously brought in. Gilmore was permitted to call a radio station for his favorite country and western songs and even talk to his idol, Johnny Cash. State officials moved swiftly to get the execution back on course. At 5 a.m. they dispatched a team of lawyers to a special hearing of the circuit court at Denver, which could overturn the judge's ruling. The warden and his advisers continued with their preparations, ready to go ahead with the execution if the legal team was successful. The lawyers presented their case, and at 6.50 a.m., the circuit court decided that the ban was misconceived and ruled that the firing squad could go ahead. Officials greeted the news with relief. The legal arguments were over. Gilmore was taken to the cannery, chosen as his place of execution. When he was safely strapped to an old office chair, he gave his uncle a watch, broken and set at 7.49 a.m., the time he had been scheduled to die, and asked that it be given to Nicole. A canvas bag was placed over his head and a paper target pinned on his chest. At the count of three, the rifle sounded. It was seven minutes past eight. Outside, an anti-capital punishment vigil ended with prayers. In the press room, a telephone rang. The order of the 4th Judicial District Court of the State of Utah has been carried out. Gary Mark Gilmore is dead. Gilmore's body was taken away to have transplantable organs removed. His lawyers and his uncle gave a press conference. First to speak was Ronald Stanger. When I talked with him in the wee hours of the morning, he did express thanks for many of the things that happened to him, and he expressed sorrow for the deeds that he did. Then Gilmore's uncle, Vern D'Amico, summed up his feelings. I would like to say at this time, Gary, my nephew, died like he wanted to die in dignity. Then the huge crowd of journalists and photographers sent to cover the execution were taken to the cannery to see the scene. Meanwhile, at the hospital, two names were found to be tattooed on Gilmore's left arm. On his shoulder, the word mom, and on his forearm, Nicole. There were four bullet holes in the chair, although there had been five marksmen, all volunteers from the Salt Lake City Police Force. In one of their rifles, a blank cartridge had been secretly substituted for a lethal bullet, so that if at any time in the future a member of the squad suffered pangs of conscience, he could comfort himself with the knowledge that he might not have been a killer after all. Holes for the guns had been neatly stitched in a canvas curtain to preserve their anonymity. And in this chair, Gary Gilmore's wish to die was fulfilled.